This morning's Bible reading will be out of the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all of what Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my father promised, which I and which you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist was baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates. The father is set by his own authority. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from, taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've been working on the Vacation Bible School memory verses for four weeks now. Next week will be the last one because there are five days in Vacation Bible School, five memory verses, and we've been dealing with the scripture lessons that the children will be dealing with. <coughs> now, first of all, I find it interesting that anybody would pick Acts 1 to read a vacation Bible school and deal with the children. Nobody reads Acts 1. I mean, it's there, and those of you who are go-getters and read the whole Bible, yeah, you read Acts 1. But what we're really looking for, we want to get to Acts 2. Acts 2 is the Pentecost story. And the Holy Spirit comes with the sound of a great wind, and there are tongues of flame on everybody's head, and they speak in all the different kinds of languages, and Peter preaches and 5,000 are converted. That's what we want to get to. We want to get to Acts chapter 2. That's the exciting stuff. Nobody reads Acts 1. If you kept reading Acts 1, I don't know if you paid attention, but when Martha was listing those disciples that are in there, if you kept count, there were 11 names that were lifted up. And so if you keep reading in um, Acts chapter 1, past where we stop, what you discover is the story of how Luke thing, Judas Iscariot, the traitor, died. Which, by the way, does not blend with the way that Matthew, the writer of the book of Matthew, thinks Judas Iscariot died, but that's the Bible. And we're sure not going to deal... Yeah, it's bloody, it's gory. If you're flipping to Acts 1 right now, see how that story goes? We're not dealing with that in the Bible school. I'll tell you right now. But nobody reads Acts 
one unless they're mildly interested in what happened to Jews. We want to get to the good stuff. We want to get to Acts 2, Pentecost. By the way, if you see Griselda Montalban, our children's director and the director of Hispanic Ministries, okay, don't ask her any questions that require brain work. The woman is tired. She has spent the entire last week preparing for vacation Bible school, and somewhere, I don't know if it was Wednesday or Thursday, she also discovered that she had a due date of Friday for paperwork because her upcoming visit with the District Committee on Ordained Ministry. The District Committee on Ordained Ministry has candidates come back once a year, sort of as an annual checkup. And her checkup's coming up, and her paperwork was due Friday. And let me tell you, she is cross-eyed right now. If you see Griselda, don't ask her any questions. Don't expect her to have any uh, new thoughts. Just pat her on the back and say, you go, we're with you. Hang in there. Good job. A lot of encouragement. She has spent the week preparing. Now, it's not to say that she hasn't had any help. She has. But she should have been resting that week because the week before she was at Bridgeport Camp. I don't know how long it's been since she went as an adult to children's camp. But it takes about a week to recover from that. So Griselda and the whole church, well, the reality is all of us have been preparing for vacation Bible school. Some of you will remember we had a vacation Bible school communion meal offering. And some of you have given a little extra so that we make sure we have enough. And some of you have been doing things. Some of you brought your Pringles cans and your paper towel rolls. And all the things that we do in order to get ready for vacation Bible school. And tonight it starts. Now, the interesting thing about Vacation Bible School is that VBS is not the goal. Yeah, I know. It's been a busy three or four months getting ready for it. It's certainly been a busy week getting ready for it. But Vacation Bible School is not the end-all, be-all of all that preparation. Because Vacation Bible School itself is simply to help those children prepare. We've been doing preparing in order to help children prepare. We want children to prepare their lives to walk as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We've been preparing to help children prepare to be a part of the people of God, part of the community of faith. And that's not something that we will accomplish in just five evenings. So yeah, we've been preparing hard, and I will admit, there are some people who are looking forward to Saturday. But it's not because Vacation Bible School was the goal. Vacation Bible School is just another step in preparation. You're aware by now that the church keeps its own calendar. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the secular calendar. Secular calendar runs January through December. You know, we're used to that. The school calendar runs August through May or June. Some companies have a fiscal calendar. They may pick a month sometime in the year and say, all right, this is the first month of our fiscal year. And then they run it for the next 12 months. The annual conference of the United Methodist Church runs our year from July 1st to June 30th, which is why last week there were so many new pastors in pulpits in United Methodism, because that's our year. But the church has a completely different year, and the church has a different year because we do not pay attention to any of the rest of that. We only pay attention to the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the church year starts with the birth of Jesus, actually preparing for the birth of Jesus. So some of you will know we have a season called Advent. That's when we prepare for Christmas. And then we have the 12 days of Christmas. And then we have a season called Epiphany. And Epiphany is where we explore what it means for Christ to be revealed to the world. The wise men were the first time that we say that Christ was revealed to the world. 
And then sometime either in February or March, we begin getting ready for Easter. We have a season of preparation called Lent. And we spend Lent doing some self-reflection and fasting and extra prayer. And then the Easter season, the great 50 days of celebrating the resurrection. And finally Pentecost, the 50th day of Easter, second chapter of Acts, every year without fail. We turn everything to red. We wear red and put extra candles out. And we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then we have a problem. I don't know if you ever look at the inside bulletin uh, for the, not, for the uh, 845 service. But in the 845 service, there is a list of what Sunday each is. And it's not very exciting. Because after Pentecost, the rest of the year is known as the season after Pentecost. Isn't that fun? There are some denominations that actually call it. This is ordinary time. I don't think that's any better. Now back in the late 60s, early 70s, the United Methodist Church tried to get something going. They said, you know what? We need to name this season. This is a long whole season and we need to have a name for it. We need to have sort of a goal for it. And so the United Methodist Church came up with the title Kingdom Tide. So if you're an old style Methodist, you may have something that says Kingdom Tide. And that's the period between the Sunday after Pentecost and the first Sunday of Advent. And the idea there was to say, how is it that we're supposed to bring about the kingdom of God in the world? And that went on for about 10 years, and the rest of the church never cottoned on, and finally United Methodist Church sort of dropped it. So now we have, you know, the season after Pentecost. Whoopee. You know, Christmas time, that's exciting stuff. We can get people to come to church later. Easter, you betcha. The season after Pentecost, not so much. I'm not sure what happened. I, that we ran out of dates to celebrate Jesus or what. We keep reading the Jesus stories, of course, but, you know, birth, death, resurrection. And the problem is that this season after Pentecost is longer than all the rest of them combined. There's more season after Pentecost than there is either Christmas or Easter. The color for this season is green. And the thought behind that is because green is the color of growth. And what's supposed to be happening during this season is we are supposed to be growing in our faith. Now, of course, that's true for Christmas and Easter as well. But in this ordinary time, we're supposed to be concentrating on what it means for us to be prepared. You see, nobody ever reads Acts 1 because it's a, basically a chapter of preparation. Jesus says, don't leave Jerusalem until God gives you the gift that God's going to give you. And we probably would do well to look at this chapter again because there are at least three things that go on if you're getting ready for a gift from God. Number one, you stay together. It's very specific. The disciples and certain women and the brothers of Jesus and who knows how many other people stuck together in that upper room in Jerusalem. And the second thing that Acts chapter 1 says is that they were constantly in prayer. Now, we didn't get to it, but if you got your way through the Judas Iscariot story, the next thing that happens in Acts chapter 1 is it's the first nominating community meeting. The very first nominating community meeting of the whole church happens in Acts chapter 1. Because now that you have 11 disciples, you've got to have 12. And so the group nominates two people, and they don't vote the way you and I vote. They vote by casting the dice, and whoever's number came up, that was who was going to be the 12th disciple. Now, I am not advocating that when we start tossing dice at charge conference. That is not a good idea. But that's how they did it back then. But that's how they were getting ready. Jesus had told them, you stay in Jerusalem because God is going to give you a gift. So they stuck together, 
They were in prayer all the time, and they got their leadership ready. And I think, friends, that this season after Pentecost, this ordinary time, this kingdom time, is longer because the reality is you and I are always in preparation. We are always in a time of preparing. First of all, we are always in a time of preparing on an individual basis. You and I are mortal. We're going to die one of these days. And you and I need to always be in preparation for that day. If you don't have a will, it's time to write one. If you don't know that you're going to die, let your pastor be the first one to tell you. On an individual basis, you and I need to be preparing all the time. And what we have been promised as a gift from God is eternal life. So you and I probably ought to be preparing for life with God. For a more intimate relationship with Jesus. And everything you and I do as Christians, when we pray, when we give, when we serve others, when we come to church to worship, when we invite others to come to church to worship, all of that is in preparation because that's what's good for our souls. When you and I renew our baptismal vows, when you and I come to the communion table, all of that is preparation. It's getting ready. And the way we prepare is we draw nearer and nearer to Christ. And that's not only happening on an individual basis, it's happening as a group basis too. Because you and I are the church. And every week we have an expectation which we give prayer to. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And as the church, you and I are always in preparation for that day when the kingdom comes. You and I are always getting ready for the kingdom. That's why we have Vacation Bible School, because we are going to reach out to children so that they can glimpse what it means for the kingdom of God to be on earth. That's why we have Sunday School, children and youth and adults, so that you can catch a glimpse of what it's going to be for the kingdom to be on earth. That's why we have food distribution this coming Saturday, so that others can know what it means to be the people of faith so that others can glimpse what that kingdom is going to look like on earth. You and I are always preparing for the kingdom. You and I are always in a preparation mode, both on a personal level and on the community level. Because we know that God loves this world and we are prepared to do what it takes to make sure that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, okay. The season after Pentecost, or ordinary time, doesn't sound very exciting. But the reality is, friends, you and I spend our whole lives in preparation to live on a permanent basis with Jesus. And we really ought to get ready for that. And be prepared. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.